So just to quickly recap what we're doing so far, we had a fundamental argument in Abiyashi Rish Lakish that whether um, the use of the item is basically the is basically what the, the essence of the item itself. So therefore, Kenyan paid us. Kenyan goes, if you sell somebody a field, you say, I'm selling you the field so you can have the yield. So you have the Kenyan payers, the exclusive use. It's as if you own the thing itself. So therefore, for example, you would have to bring the Kurim from the first fresh fruit. Or do we say that Kenyan paid us is not like Kenyan goof. That means there's two parts. There's the use of it and there's the item itself. And therefore, if I sell you a, a, um, a field merely for its yield, then all you have is the yield and not the field itself. And uh, we brought in a, a whole discussion about if I, if uh, somebody, a donor, gives it to Reuben and then says, Reuben, after you complete it, you give it to Shimon. And after you, know, after you pass on, give it to Shimon. And after Shimon passes on, you give it to Levi. And then we said that if Reuben passes away, it moves on to Shimon, Shimon to Levi. If Shimon predeceases Reuben, so then Levi has no con contact with it at all, and it remains with either Reuven, the original person, or according to one opinion, it actually goes back to the donor. And we explained that even according to the Shlokish that says that Kenyan paid us love to Kenyan goof, which means that if you have the use of it, you don't really own it. So why is it that if Reuven passed away, doesn't it go back to the donor according to, according to the first price? L'chayra, Reuven passed away. All he had was the use of it. So therefore, it should go back to the donor. And she, there's no Shimon anymore around, passed away. She should go back to, to the donor. And Rishlaki said that when you give something away, in other words, the logic behind it is very simple. If I sell you a field for the, for the use of the, let's say, the produce for 10 years, 5 years, 15 years, so then eventually it comes back to me, which means I never really relinquished ownership of the entire field because eventually it comes back to me. But in this particular, so therefore we say Kenyan paid us, all I gave you was the use of it, but not the item itself. That's the view of the Shlokish. But in this case over here, when you actually said, give it to Reuben, and then I want Reuben to pass it on to Shimon when Reuben passes away, they should inherit it. Yeah. And when Shimon passes away, it should go on to Levi, it should move on to Levi. So that, and, and then what happens? It remains with Levi. So, so the donor never expected it to come back to him. And therefore, he's giving the entire thing away, not just the use of it, but the item itself. So Rosh Lakish says, Acharecha is different. Then we brought a Brisa that, in fact, there's an argument between Rebbe and Rav Shimon and Gamliel, this very, according, this very idea about Kenyan paytas, whether it's Kenyan goof or not. This is how the Rosh Bam learns. I was a little bit different. They're arguing about the concept of Acharecha itself. But anyway, if Kenyan paytas, Kenyan goof, and basically, if Shimon Gamliel said, if I gave it to Reuben, I said, Reuben, when you pass on, pass it, give it to Shimon, let Shimon inherit you. Reuben, if Reuben sold it to a third party, it's a valid sale because Reuben owned it entirely, then not only the use of it, but the Kenyan paid it to Kenyan Goof. And therefore, Reuben, if they sold it to a third party, it remains with the third party. However, Rav Shimon says the chatzila is not the right thing to do because the donor who was so nice and so generous and gave you a present and clearly said, I would like this present after you pass away, you use it, let someone else have it, then really you shouldn't be giving it to a third party, a stranger, you should really follow his request. But it wasn't conditional, so therefore if you didn't follow his request, it's still all right. But it's not the proper thing to do. So up to the Gemara here, Amr Abayi, it makes an interesting comment here. Amr Abayi, about 10 lines from the top of the page, the Kufla Mezayin Amr al Omar Abayi says, Ezehu Rasha Aru. Now you have people who are wicked, but then Aru means conniving. Wicked, but really you can't fault them legally, technically, they didn't do anything wrong. It's totally not menschlich. And what is the example of that? Ezehu Rasha Aru, who is conniving Rasha? Zehamasi Eitza. If somebody gives advice, Limkar ben Nechassim, in a case where a donor gave it to Reuben, the Reuben, after you, you pass on, I want you to give it to Shimon. And this guy advised Reuben, the Reuben, you know, technically you can sell to anybody you want and then keep the money and, and you know, you'll have your money. Why, why just, you know, why give it to Shimon? If someone gives such advice to Reuben, is Kirab Shimon Gamlil, that is devious, cunning, sly, will call you a Russia Arum. So the question is very simple. 
If the person who gave the advice but didn't actually do it is considered a conniving Russia, what about Reuven himself, the one who actually did sell the field and took the money and used it for himself? Is he a Russia? In logic, you can say he's worse than the other person who gave you advice, didn't do anything wrong. You actually carry it out. So you should be much worse. And that is the view of the preacher, Shulchan Aruch, and a few others. The Rajbam and most Rishonim say exactly the opposite. Very interesting idea. They say, if you did something which is slightly unethical, but we can understand why you did it because you had personal gain from it. Okay, maybe it's not a mental thing to do, but we're not call you a wicked, conniving person. But when you give advice to someone and you gain nothing from that advice, the only thing you gained was you harmed somebody else because of you, on account of your advice, Shimon is not going to receive anything. But what do you have from it? Nothing. That's cruel. That's called a Russia Arum. So the person Reuben who sold it maybe needed the money, wanted to pass on an inheritance to his children. Okay, you can understand, even though uh, technically what he did was not wrong, but ethically maybe it's questionable. But you can understand where he comes from. But if you're giving advice and you gain nothing from that advice other than harming another person, that we have no time for. So the Mark continues. Omar Rabbi Yechel, Rabbi Yechel says, Halacha ke Rab Shimon ben Gamliel. The halacha is like Rab Shimon ben Gamliel. Then the case of you know, Reuben and Shimon, if Reuben sells it, it's a valid sale. Even though the halacha is like a shlokish as well, that Kenyan Paytas is not like Kenyan Haguf. So how do you reconcile these two halachas? We rule like Rab Shimon we learned. The rule is like Reish Lakish, that Kenyan Paytas, that if you own the, 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 just the, the produce, I guess, and the use of it, it's not like Kenyan, um, <clears throat> it's not like you own the item itself. And yet we rule like Rav Shimon Gamliel that if Ruben sold it, it's a valid sale. So we need to come back to the answer that we learned yesterday, and we just mentioned before, that Acharech, for this particular case, is different, because if, since the donor said to Ruben, it's yours, then give it to Shimon, then give it to Levi, and then once it stays by Levi, that's where it remains, so Reuven, so the donor completely gave it up. So what he gave to Reuven was everything. And therefore, even a shlokish will concede that in this case, you can, uh, Reuven can sell it. It's only Rebbe who disagrees. Rebbe holds, I don't believe in the Zacharecha business, and the uh, Kenyan paid us, never a Kenyan aguf, and Reuven had no right to sell it. Said the Gemara, however, we learned previously, this a matna shchivara, somebody who's dying on his deathbed, and he distributes his entire wealth, all of his assets. If he retains any assets for himself, that means he's saying, I hope I'm still going to live. Then there's no such thing as a matna shkimura. Matna shkimura is, you want these assets, but you know you're about to pass on. So you're giving it away to your children and your family, but you don't want it to take effect until after this person dies. That's called a matna shkimura. But the thing is, after the person is dead, he can't distribute it anymore. He's no longer around. So the Rabbanon made a special decree that anything that he, any um, any request that he had or instructions that he gave prior to his death, if he's dying, then we have to carry it through. Otherwise, he thinks that nobody's listening to him and that's going to exacerbate the situation. That's called Matzah Shibra. We also learned that you could be a healthy person, but if he, if he used certain wording, according to one opinion, he said, Mahayoyim ula I don't want to be yours till after I pass away, this guy says, but it starts Mahayoyim. Or according to Rabbi Yaisi, just writing today's date is sufficient to say that you want it to be, you want it to work, but you don't want to take effect until after the person dies. So it's as if you gave the goof to that person and you retained the use of it, like life tendency, until this person dies. So that's called a uh, matma's body like a shchimra or a matma shchimra. So what happens if Reuben, instead of selling it to a stranger, gave it away? To a stranger as a matna shkimra. No, you don't want it to be, to, to be activated until Reuven dies. But on the other hand, there's a deal that if Reuven dies, he moves on to Shimon, Acharecha. So which one takes precedence? So we're going to say over here that there's a difference. A shkimra, a shkimra does not take effect until after the person is dead. As long as the person is alive, even though he's on his deathbed, he still has the ownership. It doesn't pass on until after the person dies. But in the case of Acharecha, where the donor said, look, as long as you're able to use this product, I want you to use it. Once you can no longer use it, it goes on to Shimon. So you don't have to wait till the person passes away completely. If the person's ready in the throes of dying, the last couple of minutes, he can't use it anyway. That's At that juncture, that's when the Acharecha kicks in. So the Acharecha 
takes precedence over the matnas shivara. This happens while the person is dying, and matnas shivara happens post the person's death. So it says the Bible. Everyone agrees. Shmuel agrees. He knows the matnas shivara. If Reuben decided instead of selling it, gave it away as a gift to take effect after after Reuben dies, the asikulim is worthless. My time of why Amar Abaya Abaya says matnas shivara loykana. A gift of a shivara is not koyne el achamisa. Does not take effect only till after his death. But the problem is, it took place before he died. As soon as you're no longer able to use the product, it was transferred to Shimon's domain. Says the Gemara, so you're telling me that that Shibara takes effect only after the person dies, but we find that by elsewhere actually believes that even the match Shibara takes effect as he's dying, not after. So therefore, it's really concurrent. Me, I'm Rabbi Hachi. Rabbi, you say that. Why didn't we learn Matna Shlimera Me'ein Masai Kana? Matna Shlimera when to take effect. I'm Rabbi. Rabbi, you say. Rabbi, Rabbi, you says. Im Gemar Misa as the person is dying, as the person dying is taking effect. <clears throat> Not after the person dies, but as the person is dying. It's Rabbi who says Laachar Gemar Misa after he died. So the Chayyim Rabbi is contradicting himself because here he clearly says that while the person is dying, that's when. The matna shkibra takes effect, which is the same time as the acharechos that it moves on to the other person. So the Gemara, you're right, but how did Abaya Abaya ultimately changed his mind after he heard from Rabbah that a shkibra takes effect after the death? He agreed with Rabbah and he changed his mind, and therefore acharecha takes precedence over the matna shkibra. Says the Gemara, how do you know which one he changed his mind from? Says the Gemara, the Mai the Mai he behind he changed his mind from that. Didn't know how to be. Maybe, maybe this is this was his first opinion. The argument, of, um, um, uh, what do you call a buyer of it, and then and what he said later on that um, sorry, maybe maybe that the, the first thing he said was that Acharecha takes precedence, but later he changed his mind and he argued with Rava and he says no no no, Shemira is also happening as the person is dying. I don't know which way he changed his mind from. They want to learn now. They can't even say that because it's pretty clear from a Mishnah that really the gift of a Shimra only takes effect after the person dies. We see it by divorce, but from there we can see the principle. But now we learn if a person wants to protect his wife, she shouldn't be, no children, she shouldn't be stuck with the Yavun or Brahma. So now we learn if a person says, this is your, your get. Um, <clears throat> Uh, what do you call it? Um, he doesn't want to divorce his wife, but he wants to protect her. He says, no, this get is valid. If I, if I pass away, then this get is activated. So what's he saying here? When does it take effect? Only after he died. How do I know that? Maybe it's happening. Maybe the get takes place the last few minutes as he's alive, while he's alive. We'll see in a minute. Or he tells us, this is you get if I, if I pass away from this particular sickness. Um, so this is you get after... Um, this you get after I die. Why not? Because what he's really saying is the get should not be activated till after I die. But once a person is dead, there's nothing to divorce because he already lost all his ties with his wife. So what is he clearly from here? That a gift or anything that a person gives at the deathbed does not take effect till after the person dies. So therefore, Abai wouldn't argue because the principle seems to be in a Mishnah. So Abai agrees that Shemira takes place after the person dies, but Acherecha takes place as the person is dying. So Acherecha takes precedence. That's number one. Number two, another law. Amar Abzeda, Amar Abyechim, Halacha, Halacha, Hashem Gabriel, and that one, that one, or he gives it over Shimon, Vafilo Ben Abadim, even if they were, let's say, amongst the asses, they were slaves. And like I set them free. Now, why? What's the why? Are we highlighting this? If it belongs completely to Reuben, he can do whatever he wants. It doesn't matter whether our body are considered a property, whether they're considered mobile, you know, metabolism. It's irrelevant. The fact is, it belongs entirely to Reuben. He can do whatever he wants. Pshita isn't it obvious. Says it's not so obvious because we learned more of that you're not allowed to sell. You're not allowed to sell an evid because it says an evet kanani, a non Jewish evet, you have to keep forever. Your and Avera Machlek is Rishonim, whether it's Mahatoido or the Rajba or the Rabbanon, but your Aver and Avera. And therefore, we, can, we would have thought that when this person gave you a gift, it's as if he said, You know, I'm happy for you to use my products, but I don't want you to commit a sin because of me. It's a little bit like I placed a stumbling block. 
So maybe it's as if he said, I don't want you to, to liberate this Evid because it's the wrong thing to do. So Mao thought, I never gave it to you to do a very my product. Kamash Ramon, no, that once he gave it over and he didn't make any contingencies or any conditions, Ruben could do with it whatever he likes. And even if it turns out to be a slide of Eda, it's on Ruben's head. Ruben takes responsibility not to donor. Even if he ended up using it to uh, cover a mace, and the law is whatever you put on a mace, on a dead, on a corpse, is, um, is uh, what do you call it? Is also Bahano, you cannot have any benefit from it. So therefore, we would have thought that the, the donor, so if the donor is saying, I want to give you a gift, I want you to enjoy it, my largesse. But if you're going to make it us and you cannot use it, then why am I giving it to you? So it's as if it's an unwritten um, condition that you need to use it for something you can use it for. Um, it's important to ask Shita, why shouldn't Ruben do whatever he wants? And what I said, Mount Emerald thought the Shavini said, No, I didn't give it to you to put away in the closet and lock it up, I gave it to you to enjoy. Kamash Ramon, that once you gave it over, you have, you have to learn how to give presents. Once you give a present, there are no strings attached. That person can do with it whatever he likes. Even though the Chayda, the, the Mepharshim, the Rishayim already asked, what's the Chiddush over here? They're doing the Mitzvah. And of course for a Mitzvah it's a good thing. What do you mean Aswana? It's a Mitzvah to give Tachrichim to a mace. So why would the donor not be, why would you even think that the donor would say, I'm not happy? So we're talking about that you're giving additional Tachrichim that are totally unnecessary. So there's no real Mitzvah taking place over here. And nevertheless, once Reuven has it, he can do with it whatever he wants, according to Rav Shimon Mingam So now the Gemara continues, and we go on to another same argument about Kenya Pate, but we go to an interesting area. When it comes to the Arba Minim, it says in the Torah, it has to belong to you. So if you borrow a Esri or a Lulu, you have not fulfilled your mitzvah, because it's not yours. It has to be yours. So that's talking about the first day yamtiv, and some say the second day yamtiv, but that's it. Chalamoid, you can borrow a little. You can't steal, but you can borrow a little. So what happens if I say to somebody, here's the Esrik, Ben Shulvan Esrik, and then after you finish, I want you to pass it on to the next person. As a Reuben, pass it on to Shimon. So Reuben only has the use of it, Kenyan Paris. So it did, it did Reuben fulfill the mitzvah when I gave it to him? Because if you hold that the use of it is not, is Kenya Pedis, is not Kenya Naguf, the use of it is not, does not mean that you actually own it, then you didn't fulfill the mitzvah of Esri. Because I just gave it to you for a few minutes to do the mitzvah of Esri, then I said, pass it on to the next person. So it would, it would seem that this would be, the, that depending on which opinion you follow, if Kenya Pedis, Kenya Guf or not, whether you fulfill the mitzvah of this Esri. It If a guy says to look, I'm giving you this esrig as a gift, so it's yours. This has nothing to do with a conditional gift that I want you to return it to me. That we'll learn later. I'm giving it to you for keeps. However, for keeps for how long? Until you fulfill the mitzvah. And then the acharechel aplani. And then I want you to give it to the um, to the next person. Now, the way the Rosh Bama is, I'm giving you for keeps forevermore. Forevermore. But then after you pass away, I want you to give it to the other person. Now, what, what, why do people generally use an essay for? They use it to be a to be the mitzvah. <clears throat> now, um, so he says, so, um, and then give it to that person. Is not leirish in the yotz, but it's the first guy took it to make the bracha and be yotz the mitzvah. It is chayda. This is the machlekes of Rebbe and Hashem and Gamil. Going to Rebbe, Kenyan pay this is not a Kenyan aguf, and therefore you don't own the esrog. You're not yotz. And according to Hashem Gamil, Kenyan pay this is Kenyan aguf, and therefore, even though you have to pass on somebody else, right now it's totally yours, and you're yotz the mitzvah. That's that's the machlekes. Says the Gemara, maskev l'arad nachmis. Rebbe says I don't agree with you. Ad can. <clears throat> when do they argue, Rebbe, Rashim, Gamliel? So you are basically as follows. We said before that even according to the Shlokish, who says that Kenyan Paytas is not the Kenyan Agu, but there are exceptions. So, for example, if I tell Reuben, I'm giving you a gift, then pass it on to Shimon, and then Shimon inherits you, and then Shimon, and Lee will inherit Shimon. But I don't want it back. 
So in that case, I gave it over completely. So in other words, I do have the option, go to the Shlokish, to take the goof and give it as well. Even though generally speaking, if I sold you a, a field for its produce, all you have is the use of it, the Paris. But if I clearly say, and you can also have the goof, it works as well. Then you have everything, the Paris and the goof. Over here by Esrig, what use is there to an Esrig? What, what, what can you do for? For the mitzvah of benching Esrig. It's so therefore, but the only way you can fulfill the mitzvah of Esrig is if you actually own it. So even if all I gave you was the use of it, I had to give you also the ownership of it in order to be able to use it. So in this case, Yesh Lakish will concede that Kenyan paid is the use of it is also includes the Kenyan Haguf that you own the pay. Otherwise, you can't be going to the mitzvah. Says the Gemara, so Rav Nachman is going to ask, "I can't let Pligi Rebbe with Ashbag house from there. Elder Mar Sava, can you pay the Kikin like Guftami? Or Mar Sava, Lav Kikin like Guftami? Which means, does Reuben have the right to sell it or not? But everyone agrees that he has the papers. In fact, he could sell the papers. You know, Reuben can sell the use of it to somebody else. <clears throat> so." When it comes to an Esrig, if you're going to tell me, make big like nothing, that he cannot fulfill the midst of Esrig with it, <clears throat> um, then what use is it? The whole use of an Esrig is to do the mitzvah. But the only way you can do the mitzvah is if you actually own the product itself. So what do you mean you can tell me, oh, I'm letting you use the Esrig, but it's not really yours. So what am I going to use the Esrig for? So in this case, everyone concedes that Kenyan Pelet is Kenyan Aguf. Says the Gemara further, everyone agrees that Reuven fulfills the bits of Essig. You know, the question is, what about Machra? What about instead of giving it to Shimon, Reuven decided to sell the Essig? Or he ate the Essig. In this case, is Rebbe of Shimon Gamil. And here's the argument of Rebbe and of Shimon Gamil. Why? Because Rebbe holds. That Kenyan paid his life to Kenyan Aguf, you should have left the Essex so you could pass it on to Shimon. But the, but the fact is that you didn't give Shimon the um, you didn't give Shimon an Esrig. You need to buy Esrig or buy him an Esrig or give him money for the value of the Esrig. But according to Rab Shimon, Kenyan paid his is Kenyan Aguf belongs completely to Reuven, and therefore he can sell it as well. And Shimon gets nothing. So it comes out a very interesting sort of dichotomy here. So it comes out that in in owning the essence of the product itself, which we refer to as Kenyan Haguf, you can divide that as well. Uh, in other words, as, as far as Rish Lakish or Rebbe is concerned, Kenyan Pelis is not like Kenyan Haguf. So we said it follows. In order for you to fulfill the mitzvah of Essig, you actually have to own the goof. So on the one hand, Ruvain owns not just the use of the Essig, but the, he owns the Essig itself. Otherwise, he hasn't filled the mitzvah. But at the same time, he doesn't have the right to sell it to somebody else because he doesn't really own it. So he owns it and doesn't own it at the same time. As far as the mitzvah is concerned, he owns it. As far as selling it to somebody else, he doesn't really own it. He doesn't have the right. So it's a bit, uh, you need to work out like splitting hairs here, how you have like ownership and non-ownership at the same time. Anyway, the order continues. What about Achim? You have a, you're an estate and you have a number of siblings, but they haven't divided yet the assets. So everyone has a chalik in all the assets. And then later on, we divide. Now, what happened over here is, that um, if the brothers would have made up between each other, it's one esrig, you use it. So when it's yours, it's totally yours. And then they all allow each other, no problem. So at the time when you bench the esrig, it's totally yours. But one of the brothers here went along and decided to use the esrig without asking any of the other brothers. But the problem is that five brothers here, each one has a chalik in the esrig. You only have a fifth of the esrig. So Achish, you can't ask the The brothers bought an esrig uh, with their estate. Not lu echen mehen by one of them took the esrig to make a bracha. Im if he has the right to eat that esrik, because there are other esrikim there as well, so the other brothers have other esrikim that they can use, then we will say, well, yes, Brera, if this is what I proved that all along, this was my particular esrik. However, the im laugh, but if there are no other esrikim, this is the only esrik, so then everybody wants to have a chel, his layotza, he has not fulfilled his mitzvah of esrik, because he took it without permission, and there are partners in this esrik. 
the Davke, the Isa Esrach, Davke, the each of the our brothers have their own Esri, or they would go to the the Mitzvah. I will punish him if all the in exchange of the Esri, they have a pomegranate or a Quincy fruit, like it doesn't work. That's so obvious. Obvious. What's, what, what's going to help with the brothers get a pomegranate for your Esri? Why should you be Yates of the Esri and you should have the Esri all for yourself? I mean, what's going to be saying? So the Shabbat uses a very strong language, which you don't, is very. I would say unedifying language, and you don't normally find it in the Rishbam. I'll quote you the Rishbam says here. This is in the Rishbam in the middle of the page, like five lines of the page. He says, These words, Parish Verimai Loi, that the quince uh, apple and the, and the pomegranate, is, 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 it doesn't help if the brothers have it. Arichas Pirush Shal Shaitimu. This is an expansion of a Gemara that was written by Shaitim. The Einam in a Gemara. This is definitely not part of the Gemara. Somebody inserted here and doesn't know what they're doing. Even though Tasis tries to work out a way that maybe he can fit it in, but Tasis himself is not very happy. Anyway, but we also say, based on this, that this is only applies to um, to family, and they all have a chelik. If a community buys an estric jointly, and this, you know, in the old days, they had one estric for a community. If they buy it jointly, then automatically, and other whether it's automatic or they have to specify beforehand. The reason why we bought it, everyone contributes a little bit, is so that we can be yaitse. And everybody, the only way you can be yaitse the first day or the first two days is if it belongs to you. So according to Rajbam, you don't even have to make it up. It's obvious that we're very happy that whoever has the Lulu and Essig is in the hand at the time, our yaitse 100, it's theirs. So we don't even have to spell it out. It's obvious. According to others, Whoever has it, it's theirs at the time. So that's how it works in a, in a communal th- setting of a woman. Now comes on the Gemara. We learn the Gemara that we have in condition. Oh, my rubber says rubber. This is known as a concept, a conditional gift. I'm giving you a gift on the condition that you give it back to me. And if you don't give it back to me, then I never gave it to a gift in the first place. So when it comes to an asterisk, the first day, the first two days, the din is by an essay and lulu that has to be yours, so, but you're giving it to other people around you who don't have their own lulu and essay, you want them to bench. So you say to them, I'm giving you a matana, it has to be yours, but I'll on the condition that you give it back to me. If you don't give it back to me, then I never give, then you never, I never grant you this gift and you won't get to your mitzvah. In fact, in the Rishonim, we have two, two uh, wor- wording. One is you weren't going to your mitzvah, but other Rishonim add, and therefore you're a ganif. Why do you have my essay in your hand? It doesn't belong there because you didn't give it back. So you're between these two things. Uh, what about the rest of Yom Chalamoid to you? So with you on the condition, you give it back to me. If if you tell me that on condition, you give it back to me, um, th- th- the problem is that it's not yours because I never gave it to you as a gift. So it's not yours. Who cares? The rest of Yom doesn't have to be yours. I can borrow no problem. But if you're a goslin, then the rest of Yom Tov, even a goslin, has not fulfilled the mitzvah because it's known as a mitzvah habob aver, a mitzvah that's done through an aver. Now, so let's do this. Amar of Zerob. Esig zenoslo matana. I'm giving you this gift. Esig is a gift. I'm a nasha tach zerele in tradition. You give it back to me. The, not when he took it. The yotzah boy fulfilled his mitzvah. So now it depends. Hech zero if he gave it back to you, yotzah, he fulfilled the mitzvah. Loyotzah didn't give it back to you. Loyotzah he didn't fulfill the mitzvah. Why Kamashalon? We learn out from here. Matana Manas Lahaza Shma Matana. Conditional gift is a valid gift. The Gemara says, do not the Gemara in Kedushin, and uh, sorry, Sukadap Navov says, don't give a lulav to a child, because a child can acquire, but a child cannot um, grant back, cannot sell. So if you gave the child the first day lulav and essig, the child can't give back to you. And therefore, all of the Shalarak and every way they try to work out how so how do you give a child a lulav and essig the first day to fulfill the mitzvah? Some say it doesn't matter if it belongs to the child, because chinuch, as the Mishnah Bura wants to bring, the chinuch is just a general idea of holding a lulav and esrog in the hand. But whether it, it belongs to the child or not, these details doesn't matter when it comes to chinuch. Others totally disagree, because the whole idea of chinuch is to train the child now the way he should be when he grow up. And growing up, if it's not a child, and not yaitzah. So how can it be yaitzah? So others say that when you give the lulav and esrog to the child, you still hold on to the lulav, so therefore you never really relinquish total control. So then, you know, it's still a problem. So how are the yaitzah? Comes along the rush, and he says, you have a, have a general question. We'll come back to this one, kid. You have a general question. 
What's the din is if you lend someone a lulav and asking and they borrow it, they have a full mitzvah. Says that I don't understand. What is the difference between a borrowed lulav or a matana manasla hachzir, a conditional lulav? It's the same thing. When I lend you something, you got to return to me. I give you a gift for a conditional gift, you got to return to me. So what's the difference? So the rush therefore learns, and there's a long text of Chayshin explaining all this. The rush, in Ejma Malaf, the rush learns what a matana manasla hachzir works as follows. I give you a gift. It's for yours forever. But there's a rider here, there's a provision that says, but you must give it back to me. And if you don't follow that condition, then it's like I never gave it to you in the first place. You're not going to the mitzvah. So the matan is forever. So what does that mean, said the Rosh? When, let's say, you finish doing the little blessing and give it back to me, I have to make a kenya to acquire it because it's no longer mine. It's yours now. Just because if you gave it back to me, I have to lift it. I have to do something to make it mine. It's not automatic. And the Rosh, I'll prove it to you. Not only this question that we had about the show, I'll prove it to you. If matana manasa has it means automatically it reverts to me once you did your mitzvah, then why can't you give it to a child? You don't need the child to give it back to me. I'm taking it back. So the Gemara says, don't give it to a child because he can, he can, he can quiet, don't give it back to you. But do it on matana manasa has it. Well, as soon as the child fulfilled the mitzvah, it was the child at the time, automatically it becomes mine. The child doesn't have to give it to me. I don't have to make a new Kenyan. That's his question. Other Rishayim totally disagree with him. And they say, is a conditional gift. You got to give it back to me. And in the case of the child, actually, you could give it to a child. The Gemara wasn't talking about a matana as The Gemara was talking about generally, don't give it to a child for keeps because they cannot give it back to you. But if you talk, the Gemara doesn't talk about a conditional gift. A conditional gift would work. So what is the difference then between a borrowed lulav and a gift? If it's both the same thing, the difference is very, a very big difference. If I lend you something and an accident happened, falls, uh, you lose it or it broke, you have to compensate me. You, you're totally responsible. But if I gave you a matana, a gift, a conditional gift, then you are responsible only if you didn't treat it the way you should be. Like you were negligent. But if you lost it, it was stolen or it was an accident happened, uh, you don't have to pay at all. Like the Rosh Bam says right here. You don't have to pay. You're not a show. So you're not a show. You're totally different. It's yours. It's completely yours for that short duration of time. And therefore, there's actually a big machlek is showing them if you made it hegdish during that time, what happens? According to some Rishonim, the hegdish is valid. But then, when the 10 minutes are over, you finish mitzvah, it, it, it disappears. According to other Rishonim, the rivet, the hegdish is valid. And when you give it back to me, I have to redeem it from hegdish. Okay, other Rishonim say you cannot make it hegdish. And it doesn't bother me that you can't make it hegdish like we discussed a few days ago because this is different. Tell you about it further. I eat said there was a woman. Now we're, ju- we're jumping back to this um, Shimon Gamliel that when I give you something to pass on somebody else, at the time that I gave it to you, it is Kenyan patent, Kenyan goof, completely yours. So what happened was there was a woman, the Havlatikula, she had a palm tree, but out of the Bibarabaya. On the land, right in the middle, stack in the middle of the land of Bibarabaya. And she would go and, and, and uh, you know, and, uh, and cut down these um, dates. Call Amos to have the and mix it, but every time she went in to cut it down, have a copy of the lion, uh, people were very upset because she used to go and walk on the crops and ruin many crops. It was very upset. And she she didn't want to upset Rabbi Barabaya, big time of So what she did was, Aknis and Nella, Kol Shnei Chaj, you know what? Either she sold it, you gave it a gift, you can have it as long as you're alive. It's yours. And when you pass on, give it back to me. Ozaliu, so remember, Rav Shimon will say that if, she say, if a person says, Ruben, it's yours, and when you pass away, give it to Shimon. So Biba Baya says, okay. She said, it's mine. And when you pass away, go back to her. But while it's mine, I can do whatever I want. I'm going to give it to my children. And then therefore, my children will, be, will, will now own the palm tree and they'll, they'll be in control and they'll, they'll cut down the dates without ruining the crop. Ultimately, he went to Akhenel, because he gave it to his younger son. He thought it would be, you outsmart the woman. We learned in Yomar Rosh Hashanah, even though the Rosh Bam says it was Rabba, there we actually say it's Rabba. That Rabba and his nephew Abaya, whose Abaya's real name was Nachmeni, and Rabba's father was Nachmeni, so Rabba couldn't call Abaya by his real name, because Abaya lost his parents young, and uh, Rabba raised him with his, uh, with his uh, maid. Um, and um, so because Abaya 
um, what it called, because the Rabbah couldn't call Abaye by his name, because that was his father's name, he made up his name, Abaye, which came from a Pesach, okay, that Hashem is with, um, actually, Ruchemba, um, that Hashem is with the Yisayimim and all that. And Eli was cursed, that his descendants will pass away young, and it says that, that Zedach, Mincha, their Kabbalah is not going to help. So Gemara says, but if you learn Torah, and, and you give charity, it will help. So Rabbah, passed away at the age of 40 because he mainly learned Torah. So it's amazing. Rabbi was a Rosh Hashiva 20, for 22 years. That means he became Rosh Hashiva when he was 18 years old. And he won against Rabbi Yosef and all the great Amorim at that time. So it gives you some kind of an inkling of what kind of great personality Rabbi himself was. And Rabbi lived for 60 years. Rabbi mainly learned Torah. Rabbi did both. He learned Torah, but also did Gmilz Chasadim. So therefore, he, learned, he lived for 60 years. But the Ailey was cut down, and therefore he said to him, because you come from the city of Moloi, is therefore you're saying things which are cut down, or you're saying things which have a blemish. No, what you did is wrong. Why? Why is he right? I feel that if Shimon and Gamliel let come and Allah, she was saying, if, he, if, if this woman says, or this person says, after you go to somebody else, no, I'm relinquishing my total ownership. I don't want it back. So I'm giving you the paydish and the goof. And then you can do whatever you want. Otherwise, whatever the over goes to the other person. But if I'm saying give it back to me, then clearly even if she will agree, I didn't give you the, the, the tree itself. I just gave you the, the, the right to cut down the date to keep the fruit, but not the tree itself. So you can't, there's nothing to you to pass on to your children. Then the Gemara goes back to this Matanam Lasa Hazer. And the Lama the, the, the Shayim say that there's something wrong with the Gemara, that we throw in another subject right in between in the middle of talking about matan as a hazard. But let's continue. Amar Anachim, Shoyza Nazar Matan, I'm giving this, uh, this cow as a matan, Amanas Shetach Zireli. I'm giving it to you on the condition that you give it back to me. Hegdeshe. So what happens? The, the recipient went ahead and consecrated, and then Mechazet gave him back the cow. So he returned the cow. Hareza Mukhesh and So according to Rav Nachman, you, you, you met the conditions, and therefore the, um, the cow now becomes. Because I gave it to you at the time it was yours. It was totally, I gave him a maternal it was totally yours. You made it hegdish and you gave it back to me. So you met the condition. I'm not going to understand. Maya had it. What do you give back to him? He gave him a cow that I can't use. It's not functional. Because now it belongs to hegdish. It's as if he didn't give it back. And because he didn't give it back, he, I never gave him a ton in the first place. And therefore, it's not hegdish. He got the cow back. Who cares if it's hegdish? He said, Give me the cow back. And I gave it back to him. What's the problem? So Ravashi concludes, no Ravashi. Chazini, we see, listen to the words carefully. If he said to him, on the condition you give it back, I had to give it back, no complaints. Oh, but he, if he used the words, I want you to give it back to me. It has to be something which is suitable. Now, there is a big discussion there about Matana Asla Hazir. Normally, we learn in Gemara and Kedushin that there's all kinds of criteria that have to be met. There's four different criteria. Like, for example, you have to spell it out. If you do the right thing, then this is going to happen. If you don't do the right thing, then this is going to happen. And over here, all you said, give it back to me. Well, you don't spell it out. The Samaritan Shani want to say that the Gemara here doesn't labor the point, it's too long. And the Gemara expect you to know the laws of tonight. Others are trying to say no, that we actually we don't pass him like Ram Mayor who holds this criteria. And it's only by Gitin and by Kedushin that we are very Mahmir, but not in ordinary cases. So therefore, we don't have to meet this whole criteria. Interesting halacha. So Reuven says, I am writing that I am, I want to grant my assets to Shimon as a gift. But Amr Allah, Shimon says, I don't want it. I don't want it because it says Sayna Matana Sikha, if you don't take any gifts, you live a long life. The Samer Shaknarh in Khaisha Mishpat says if you accept gifts from people, you're beholden to them. And you can never then um, try them. You can never then you'll always, you know, try to protect them, defend them when they shouldn't be defended, because you're not free. If you don't accept gifts from anybody, you owe nothing to anyone and you can be honest and tell people the way it is. So you say I want to be one of those people. Sayna Matana Sikha. Um the din is regardless your kind of. I feel aimed with someone. He's standing and screaming, you hollow on top of your lungs. I don't want it. Too bad. We'll soon see what the logic in that is. The Yechina says, like if you don't want it, you don't want it. But Ahmad Ababa Bamamal, Rabba Mamma will plead. There's no argument here. 
can be tzavach me kara. If from the outset you're about to give me a gift, I say I'm not interested in the gift. So then, if Reuben gives Shimon a gift, and Shimon says, I'm not interested in the gift, then Shimon obviously doesn't accept it. So what happens to the item? Big machlek is in the Rishayim. So according to the Rashbam, the item now is hefker, because Reuben said I don't want it anymore. He gave to Shimon, I don't want it anymore, and and they, and Shimon doesn't want it either. So who does it belong to? No one. It's hefker, because the Rashbam says the idea of hefker is I'm walking away from the item. <clears throat> Not that I'm giving it away to you, I'm walking away from it. But Toysa disagrees. Toysa says if Reuben, if Shimon doesn't receive, said I don't want it, then it goes right back to Reuben because it, 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 Hefka is not walking away. Hefka is you have to give it to the whole world. But I never gave it to the whole world. I only was prepared to give it to Shimon. He doesn't want it. It's back to Reuben. So the Rajbam and Toysa are arguing in how do we understand the idea of Hefka, you make something ownerless. Is I'm just walking away from it or I'm giving it away to the whole world. And yeah, then the word continues. Can be shaysig me karel of a safe tower. Here's the one case where he's quiet. And then he screamed out. He said, I don't want it anymore. In that case over there, the Rajbam says, once it became Shimon's, just because you said you don't want it, it's still yours. If you don't want it, you have to physically go ahead and make it have or do something. Toysa says that, and that's what it means at all. Toysa says that, that in this case, it doesn't go back to Reuven, but it, it doesn't go to Shimon either because you said EFSHI. And Toysa says the words EFSHI, it's impossible for me, I don't want it, is tantamount to saying I'm making it have but what happened? The same story, but instead of giving you directly, he gave it to a third party, and you were there at the time and you saw it, and he said to the third party, pick it up, the star and or this Kenyan Khalipin, and have in mind that other person, because it's chus, and we always learn that Zachin la other shall be father. It's a good thing the other person kind of. But what happened was the Shasak, he was quiet, and then he screamed out. Here it's slightly different. Here comes an argument of Shimon Rabban. Because a third party here. What's the story? You're right in the chasm to somebody else. There's slaves among them. And the guy said, I don't want the slaves. It's costly. I got to feed them. So if the recipient, the beneficiary was a coin, the slaves are permitted to You know why? Because just because you said you don't want the gift doesn't make a difference. It's your gift. However, Rab Shimon ben Gamil, Rab Shimon ben Gamil says, "Kibun she'amar halo e efshi behen." Once you said, "I don't want it," kvazochu behen yoshi. The moment you said you don't want it, it didn't become yours. So it goes right back to the donor, and if the donor's not around, it goes back to his heirs. Avina ba, we try to understand what's going on here. The Tanakama, I feel Oymid with Tzavach. The Tanakama hold that even if Shimon says, I don't want these slaves, it still becomes his. Why? This is how it works. But Tzavach, if Shimon said, I don't want it from the outset, everyone agrees that Shimon is not kind. Not kind at all. What happens to it? According to Rajbam, it's Hefkir. According to Tzavach, it goes back to the donor. Shosak Ula Besayif Tzavach, if he was quiet, and then he screamed out, Everyone holds that he's kinder. And this case, everybody holds his kinder. And according to Tasis, that means it belongs, according to Tasis, it is hefker, because when you say you don't want it, it's tantamount to saying that, um, uh, what do you call it? It's tantamount to saying, I'm making it hefker. Keep pleading. When are they arguing? They're arguing is, is uh, that a third party picked it up, the Shasak, and you saw it. And you said nothing. All of a sudden, so, and then you screamed. The Tanakhama says, well, it's the same as other cases. But the Shasik, since you were silent, Kanina, you quieted it. I had to cut I, 10 minutes later, you screamed. You realize that, you know, it's expensive, it's costly. You change your mind. Change your mind. It's yours. You got to do something about it. Give it to Hefke, sell it, whatever you want. However, Rav Shimon Gamil Savar, he holds that a third party is different. That's what? And when he first he was quiet, then he screamed. It's not that he changed his mind. He's now revealing to us that all along he didn't want it. Why didn't he say anything before? Because you didn't give it to me yet. You gave it to a third party to eventually give it to me. So I thought, you know what? I'll wait till they come to my house and knock on my door. I'll tell them then I don't want it. The Heidel and Tzavach Hashem, why didn't scream till now? The Tzavach, he thought, I don't have it yet. Why should I scream? And interestingly, Rajbam says, 
that to scream is very unedifying. So if it's not relevant right now, in your mind, you don't think it's relevant, why would you scream? But that's why we don't protest and do all those things, because it's not edifying. We don't do that unless it's mamish. It matters. If it matters, then you would protest. That's the Machlekes. We'll stop over here and we'll have a short talk. We'll have a good one.